It's the sound of ideas from IdeaStream Public Media. I'm Anna Huntsman, in for Jenny Hamill this week. Thanks for joining us. In recent years, law enforcement agencies have been reforming the way they handle calls involving someone experiencing a mental health crisis, moving to what's called a co-responder model. Instead of just police responding to those calls, they're paired with a behavioral health specialist or other expert trained to handle those calls with the hope to improve safety and decrease use of force instances. Thousands of cities have adopted the co-response model across the country, including locally in Cleveland and Shaker Heights. And now Akron has started its own pilot program. We're going to start today's show by talking about the Summit County Outreach Team, or SCOUT, which consists of paramedics, police officers, and behavioral health specialists who have all been trained in crisis intervention. IdeaStream Akron Canton reporter Abigail Botar has been closely following the developments of this program and joins me now in studio. Welcome, Abigail. Good morning, Anna. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. And just a note before we start that this conversation will bring up the topic of suicide. Okay, Abigail, first, let's talk about what kind of calls come in regarding a, a mental health crisis. And before these pilot programs, can you talk about how those calls were handled? Sure. I mean, uh, these can calls can really range in any kind of mental health issue we can have from someone maybe experiencing suicidal ideation to a person dealing with substance use or maybe having some sort of manic episode. But the, the issue that communities across the country have been asking is is should police be the people responding to these calls? Um, And, you know, right now in in a lot of parts of the country, um, the only option would be to call 911 and have a police officer officer or an EMS worker come out and and deal with the call as best they can with the tools that they have. Um, But something that, you know, mental health professionals and and honestly police officers have been asking is, should that be their job? And that's why we've seen the shift now to some cities um, having a co-responder model with the mental health professional coming along. Um, they've seen really great results. And so that's why we've kind of seen the expansion, as you said, in a, in a couple places in Northeast Ohio and now Akron with the hope, as it's, it's called Summit County, with the hope of, of putting it out through the entire county um, in the future. So we'll, we'll see how it goes in Akron. But that's the goal. And and, and that's kind of why is we're, we're questioning Who should this job be for? Yeah, let's expand a little bit on that. I I, um, cover the Akron Police Oversight Board, Mm -hmm. which handles complaints, and um, they have a public comment period, and often people actually come and talk about this sort Mm -hmm. of thing where they're saying, you know, my son or my daughter was experiencing a crisis, and I didn't want to call the police because I, I, I didn't think that that was right, but the police came. And can you just maybe talk a little bit about how those things can go wrong, I guess? I mean, what kind of training do police have? Mm-hmm. So there is a really great training program, and I, I say great as in it's very lauded by mental health professionals. It's called Crisis Intervention Training. And the more than 50% of officers in Akron are trained in, in this CIT training. And that gives them firsthand experience in dealing with mental health crisis, a lot of educational tools to help um, teach themselves, inform themselves on, on what mental health disorders are in the community and also what kind of um, tools they can give people who maybe experience mental health crises frequently. And so maybe they're calling the police frequently, so maybe they can help bring them to a different organization that can help with that or de-escalation tactics. Um, They even hear from someone who's dealt with a mental health crisis and a police officer was involved in that. So they hear firsthand from a community member. Um, And this is an international program. So it's across Hmm. the country. I think Akron was actually like a really uh, a first um, one of the first cities that really took this on. I think Hmm. I think it originated in Tennessee, but Akron was, you know, jumping on this program when it started decades ago. Um, So more than 50% of Akron police have this training. um, But sometimes, you know, there can't always be a a CIT officer on call. Sometimes use of force is the only option I've heard from mental health officers. If the the options are using force or Mm. the person dying by suicide, Mm. using force is the better option, I think. 
we can say, mental health professionals say. Mm. And um, and so that's the reason. But I think people are also scared, even when there are CIT officers that can respond really well to these incidents. There are, is such a stigma, especially in Akron, about the police, about not wanting to get them involved, about you know fears about what could happen. And so that's also a barrier that mental health professionals in the, in the county are trying to break down, that there are very well-trained officers that do know how to deal with these calls well. Anytime you call 911, you can ask for a CIT officer. County Countywide, I think mo- all counties in Ohio have CIT trained officers. So if that's a concern, you can ask for one hmm. when you call nine one one. That's something that um, that's pro- good to point out. Yes, that's something that they always told me to, to, to say is that you can always ask for a CIT officer. Hmm. But I mean, yeah, there's a stigma, rightly so, because there are incidences where you know things don't go the way that we may want them to go in terms of that. So I think this program is is a way to give people more tools in their tool belt. So instead of just having uh, a firefighter or a police officer, an EMS worker, um, being the only ones responding to these calls, it gives the community and dis you know dispatchers and another option to have Mm. a more highly trained professional on the front lines responding to mental health crises, which we have been seeing spiking across the country. So, you know, now is a really pertinent time to be launching this program. Right. We haven't talked as much about the fire department and EMS also having to um, respond to these calls. You spoke with Akron Fire Chief, actually, former fire chief. He just retired. (laughs) Um, Now he is transitioning to an emergency management role under um, Mayor Shamas Malik's administration. However, at the time that you spoke with him, he was Akron Fire Chief, and uh, he talked about about the volume of calls his department handles invol- involving mental health crises. Let's listen. Last year, in 2023, in Akron Fire alone, we went on over 5,000 mental health calls in the city, and that's just us. That's just us responding. We know those numbers, but there are many other incidents that occurred that probably don't get reported. That was Akron Fire Chief Joseph Nacko talking about the, the calls. So, Abigail, how did the fire department work with other agencies in the area before this pilot program was launched. Right. It's it's kind of what I said before about how you know, they're the, the they're the frontline people really to respond to all sorts of crises, including mental health crises. And and, and this is something that um, the county has wanted to change. This has been a big priority of, of Mayor Malik um, to include mental health professionals um, to, to, you know, maybe give fi- the fire department a chance to respond to fires or the police officers to respond to other specific police roles because maybe this shouldn't be their job. I think the mental health professionals I spoke with said there should be a role for firefighters and police officers. They should continue to get CIT training. They should continue to be aware of mental health issues. But including a mental health professional, including specially trained EMS workers um, in this to respond to be the front line instead of just the police officer so they can respond to other emergencies throughout the city. I mean, they get thousands of calls a day and and maybe we don't want them caught up in uh, a mental health call which can take hours you know you know to really de-escalate a situation it can take a really long time and we're ca- you know catching up our resources in one place and this could be another tool to help um, to help bring that um, the calls down it, it helps too I, I looked at some nationwide statistics um, it helps the the number of crisis use of the crisis tools that counties have goes up when um, they're using a co-responder model so people are using the um, the tools that the county offers from maybe the ADM board or from different uh, medical providers instead of calling 911 every time they're being more proactive about getting the help that they need so that we see nationwide going up and so um, if that can help you know frequent calls go down then the police have more time to to respond to other calls firefighters etc and the ADM board stands for <laughs> that is the county of summit alcohol drug addiction and mental health services board it's Got it. so long sorry that's no that's okay i had to channel mike mcintyre there for a second how <laughs> to spell out that acronym you reported on an incident last year involving a person who was experiencing suicidal thoughts and this resulted in an arrest so could you talk a little bit more about what happened there and did it help lead to reevaluating police practices so there's been several of these incidences involving Akron police and a person experiencing a mental health crisis. And 
the thing is, is that we don't know every every time something happens, but sometimes the body cam footage will circulate on social media and garner a lot of criticism from the community. So that's where I started with this specific incident that happened almost a year ago. It happened last April where a man um, was having suicidal thoughts. Um, his, uh, his friend called 911. Um, for a wellness check, um, the officers determined that the man needed to be pink slipped, which means that they would hospitalize him. Um, and the man did not want to be hospitalized. And he was he was truly in crisis. I watched like hours of, of the footage of the body cam and it ended in a physical altercation where the man was arrested. They took him to the hospital. They took him to the jail. And the two officers that originally responded to that particular incident were not CIT trained. Um after the the use of force, a bunch of more officers were called in and two CIT officers did respond and helped de-escalate the situation and get the man calmed down and ready to go to the hospital. Um, and, you know, this this happens. I Like, I, I talked to Dr. Doug Smith, who works at the ADM board. He's the medical officer. He's a psychiatrist, I believe. And he said, you know, sometimes, like I said earlier, like if the option was for the man to to be left alone and maybe die by suicide or for the officers to use force and bring him to the hospital to get help, you know, it's a, it's a really tough situation. And um, but at the time of that specific situation, Scout was well on its way. So that wasn't like a turning point or anything. This is something that the ADM board and Dr. Smith had been working on for a really long time. So Scout was well on its way to becoming a reality. And that's something, like I said, that that the mayor has wanted to do yeah. and, and, and integrating mental health professionals in these calls has been, you know, well known to help reduce this. And so that's something they had been working on for a really long time. Well, hearing you talk about it, it really sounds like it's tough for all parties yeah. involved. Um, it could be it's, you know, it's really tough for the people who have to respond. It's obviously very difficult for the person who's experiencing the challenge. So let's talk about this so-called and I say so-called because it, it's you get to know, but this solution. Yes. So this co-responder model, specifically the scout program, talk a little bit more about what it it is and who's involved in and what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, so it will it is a team of EMS workers, a mental health professional and a police officer and they all have the CIT training. Um so they all are specifically trained in crisis intervention. Um, team training and they'll be responding to calls flagged by a dispatcher or by a CIT officer that's already in the field where mental health is a concern but the person is not a danger to themselves or others. So if this is a dangerous incident where maybe weapons are involved, the police will still be the ones dealing with those types of incidents. But it's giving the community another tool in the tool belt to respond to mental health crises. Um, you know, at the press conference where they announced this, the mayor and um, the fire department said that the police officer that will be on the call will be taking a back seat during this. So they won't be leading the call. It'll really be le- led by the behavioral health specialist and by the specially trained paramedics. Um, but they'll be there to, you know, ensure safety. And then if the if the, it escalates, if there's concern about safety, then the officer can step in and then they can obviously call for backup for more officers or for EMS workers. Um, so it won't just be the team out by themselves. They will obviously be able to use the other resources that the city has to help in the call. We're talking with Ideastream Akron Canton reporter Abigail Botar about the new way that some police departments are responding to people experiencing a mental health crisis through what's called a co-responder model. If you would like to join the conversation, maybe you have a question for Abigail about her reporting on this, or maybe you have a comment about the co-responder model, give us a call, 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us, we're at Sound of Ideas. Abigail, you also talked to Tracy Yeager, uh, the president and CEO of Portage Path Behavioral Health, who said the calls the scout team will receive are when mental health is a concern, but the person is not a danger to themselves. So let's hear about that. They can best be handled without using force and with a specially trained professional are less traumatizing to individuals. So that's kind of getting to what you were just talking about earlier, where in this model, police would be at first taking a back seat, letting the mental health professional do what they are trained to do. Mm -hmm. But if things would maybe escalate or become uh, dangerous, then they step in. I'm curious, as you've been reporting on all this, you found that um, CIT is voluntary. So I'm curious, 
if you have heard from the Akron Police Department or any police officials about their thoughts on this co-responder model and, and what do they think about mm-hmm. it? So I I want to clarify because when we hear that CIT is voluntary, maybe you think that that means that the police department doesn't um, value it. But, uh, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the police. But what I know from people that work on CIT is that it's meant to be voluntary. It is not meant to be something that's mandated for police officers to do. The, the way the model works, it's supposed to be you volunteer to go get the 40 hours of training with the support of your department. And every department in Summit County has officers that are CIT trained, even ones that have low staff. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to let one of your police officers go for a whole week when you have a small department. But Every department has one, um, and it's supposed to be it's supposed to be voluntary so that you are eager to learn about this. You're not, um, you know, these officers maybe don't have the preconceived notions about mental health. Maybe they, they, you know, it's just more valued by the officer. It's so it's supposed to be voluntary. I just want to emphasize that because that is internationally that is the model. Um, I did not get the chance to interview the Akron police. They denied my interview request when I did a story earlier about this. Um, But I know that this is something that uh, 54% of Akron police officers are trained in CIT. That number jumps to 70% when we look at officers all of Summit County. Um, And I know that that I've looked at the emergency mental health procedure for the Akron police department, and it states that a CIT trained officer will be sent to mental health calls um, when available, which, you know, Depends, but and I know that they try to keep one in each shift in each area, so okay. there is at least someone. Um, but yeah, this is you know, like I said before, a huge priority for for first responders in the county and for mental health professionals and for, and for the city. So, and so this uh, the the scout program is a pilot, as you mentioned. They just launched it what a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. so we can't know quite yet, you know, how it's working, but you spoke with Dr. Doug Smith, and he's the medical director for the Summit County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Services Board, and he said the scout team is actually going to be evaluating how they're doing on an ongoing basis, so let's hear about that. We'll collect all the clinical data, we'll collect all the uh, demographic data, we'll collect what they did on the call, and then the outcome of the call, so really from start to finish. Abigail, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we've we seen in similar programs across the country how the this leads to better outcomes, reduced hospitalizations, reduced incarcerations. But, you know, the only way we know if that's true of this specific program in Akron is if, if that did data is collected here. And so, like Dr. Smith said, the team will be collecting data from start to finish on each call, including clinical and demographic information, what the scout team did on each call, what the outcome was, if there was force used, if they had to call for backup, if substances were used, etc. So basically every facet of what happened, what was involved. And that will kind of help them determine what they could improve, what they could tweak, if they could add anything to this program. And I think that will help them kind of assess expanding the program countywide. Right now, it's only available in Akron. They're only on call 8 to 4.30, I believe, Monday through Friday. And so obviously people are in crisis 24-7. So I I think kind of the hope is to expand it then to maybe being available all the time, not just during weekdays. So just in the city and then also countywide. I think that data will really help inform how it expands as we go on. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how um, they are hoping to maybe apply this eventually across Summit County. How's that going to work? Yeah. So, I mean, we don't know yet since it's it's so young. It just started. But I think the issues when talking about, you know, getting more resources, resources in the community is money and manpower. You know, you've got to pay extra people to be on call on the clock, you know, even eight to four thirty Monday through Friday. That's, you know, a lot of extra money. That's extra salaries to pay. And, and Summit County is not immune to the shortage of first responders that we've been seeing nationwide in the past couple of years. So that's also a problem. So, like I said before, Monday through Friday, eight thir- eight 8 a.m. to 4.30. Um, so, you know, the hope is to expand it to longer in Akron and then all, all throughout the county. And so, you know, that's obviously something that I'll be keeping an eye on. Anna, you obviously will also be keeping an eye on as this expands, because um, I think the hope is that this will be a really great tool for the community. And, you know, we'll keep an eye on, on, on how it's success, if it has any issues and and how 
how uh, people will try to make it work countywide. Absolutely. I know you'll be following this and uh, we appreciate your reporting as always. Abigail Botar, Akron Canton reporter with IdeaStream Public Media. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Anna. You can learn more about the Scout program and Abigail's reporting by going to ideastream.org. Also, if you or someone you know is looking for support or experiencing a mental health crisis, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Time now to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear Cleveland Heights native Peter Bendick's love of Cleveland baseball and how that led him to a high-profile career in the MLB. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Anna Huntsman, in today for Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. It's The Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Anna Huntsman, in today for Jenny Hamill. Thanks for spending the hour with us. As the Guardians prepare to take on the Oakland Athletics Thursday to start the 2024 baseball season, we're going to look at how Cleveland Heights native Peter Bendick's love of Cleveland baseball led to a prominent career in sports and his new role as the Miami Marlins' new president of baseball operations. Ideastream Public Media's Stephen Langell spoke with Bendix during spring training about his journey from Northeast Ohio to the baseball fields of Florida. It's spring training in Florida, and Miami Marlins players are getting ready for the season. Look at him. Oh, 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 guy. Same guy. Same guy? Same guy. Same guy. Yeah. Yeah. Guy. Huh? Look at him. <laughs> These are the sounds of baseball, of spring training. And at the center of all of this is Cleveland Heights native Peter Bendix, how are you liking things down there so far? I like it. It's great. Yeah, spring training is one of my favorite times of the year. So how did this kid with a passion for sports go from a baseball fan growing up in Cleveland Heights to running a baseball team in the Sunshine State? Well, Bendix says his grandmother, Gloria Goldstein, was a huge part of that journey, always supporting him while also sharing his love of sports. My mother's mother was one of my biggest champions and supporters and spent a ton of time with me and huge into sports. So she would take me to every sporting event. My parents would take me to, but my grandmother was the main one who would take me to Indians games, to Cavs games. The Cleveland Crunch Games, the National Professional Soccer League team, we went to a bunch of those. She would take me to all of my baseball practices and tennis practices. And so she was a huge influence and supporter of of really everything that I did. Um, You know, when I was into sports cards, she would take me to local sports card events she would take me to autograph signings, whatever, whatever crazy thing that I wanted to do. She was the primary person who who took me there and supported me and was was a big cheerleader for me. So she was she was really formative for me. So let me ask you, what stands out to you about growing up in Cleveland in terms of your experiences? When I was 10 years old, the Indians made it to the World Series. Cleveland Indians, after a 41 year wait, are in the World Series. That was when Jacobs Field had just opened and those teams were incredible. We were selling out every single game. I think it's still the longest sellout streak in baseball. I'm not sure about that, from 95 to maybe 01 or so. And that was my formative time as a child. And I was a a huge sports fan, every sport. I liked playing every sport. I liked watching every sport. But the Indians were the biggest thing in town, right? The Browns weren't there. The Browns had left. The Cavs were good, but their games were harder to get to. And so the Indians were really good and really fun, and I was incredibly into it. And I think that that served as probably the foundation for wanting to work in baseball. Explain a little bit more about what it was like for you growing up as an Indians fan, especially in that time of of such success, and a little bit more maybe about how that molded your perspective. It was an incredibly fun environment. The team was good. They scored a lot of runs. The games were events. It was a sellout. Everything that was what you talked about with your friends, they were um, an embodiment of a lot of the revitalization of Cleveland in a lot of ways. I did everything I could to go to as many games as possible. You know, they awarded tickets for getting on the honor roll or the merit roll. I remember calling into radio shows to try to win tickets. My family shared a season ticket package where we got to go to maybe 10 games per year. Um, And I learned where all the best, you know, 
staircases were to go up and down because we had seats in the upper deck and where the best pizza was and all, all the fun things about the stadium. Bendix adds his love of the Indians led him to an interest in statistics, and it was his knack for numbers that eventually opened the door to a baseball career. I learned the players. I became huge fans of the players and knew every stat there was to know about the players. And I would go down to the players' parking lot after the game and try to get autographs. And I knew which guys were more likely to sign and which guys weren't. All of those things. Um, and, you know, I was I, I got very into into the statistics and I stereotypically, but truly would come downstairs in the morning and my dad was downstairs in the kitchen and I would ask for the sports page and I would sit there and scour the box scores and read the sports page, uh, not just for baseball, but for every sport every morning. And I think that just informed my interest in baseball, the way that I look at the game and really just my, my passion for the game. Yeah, I can hear that in your voice even now. And that's got to be a huge part of doing your work is that passion for the sport. Absolutely. If you're not passionate, this is the wrong job for you. Bendix says his passion for player stats helped mold the way he views the game. It was his knack for what's called sabermetrics, or using statistical analysis to evaluate baseball players. that got him started on his baseball career in 2009 when the Tampa Bay Rays offered him an internship. Bendix came to the team's attention based in part on his research on the topic while student at Tufts University. Smaller market teams with lower payrolls, like the Rays, have historically used such methods to successfully compete with teams that have more money. In an odd coincidence, it was the then Florida Marlins who beat Bendix's beloved Indians in the 1997 World Series. The 0-1 pitch. A liner. but he says that doesn't phase him. It's amusing to me that I'm working for the team that in 97 beat my favorite team, but it doesn't really impact things now. In fact, Bendix says the challenges of being a Cleveland sports fan taught him to be resilient and gave him the drive to be successful. Cleveland sports hadn't won a title in however many years growing up until LeBron did it. And having that chip on my shoulder and wanting to prove people wrong, I think that is a foundational element of my Cleveland identity. Bendix, who was hired last November by the Marlins after spending 15 years with the Rays, says to be successful, you really need to care about and support your colleagues. Some of the core leadership tenets or traits that I believe in strongly are uh, kindness, humility, and logic and understanding that if people don't feel cared about, they don't really care what you know. But also, once they do feel cared about, that can lead to really good decisions and really good outcomes. He points to two former colleagues with the Rays that influenced him while he was with the club. First, Eric Neander, the team's current president of baseball operations. He had started with the Rays maybe a year before me, a year and a half, and I worked very closely with him throughout my whole time there and getting to see how he treats people, first and foremost, how much he cares, how he treats people and puts them in positions to succeed is something that I've really tried to emulate since I first got to know him and watch him rise his way up through the organization and see how at each step of the way he put his ego aside and he was there to help other people and to put them in positions to succeed. And the way that he utilized that to create this culture where people really felt supported and cared about. I continue to emulate that. I continue to to benefit from having worked with him and learned from him. And I think that his leadership style is something that I aspire to. He also credited former scout Bart Braun with playing an important role in his development. When I was relatively early in my career with the Rays, I don't remember how early, but they had a very um, stereotypical old school scout been around, seen it all, tobacco chewing, you know, he's, when you picture a scout, it was this guy. And he didn't have to, but he welcomed me to go out and see players with him. And not only welcomed me, but made me feel welcome, right? Made, didn't make me feel like I was burdening him. And so I would, I would take advantage of this. I'd go out and see local games, professional games, whatever, and just try to shut up and listen. 
And I remember one of my favorite stories from him is we went to see the late Jose Fernandez, the pitcher who uh, died in a tragic boating accident. But before his passing was an incredible player for the Marlins. We went to see him in high school. I hadn't been to very many high school games, so I was just following the scout along. And we settle in behind home plate and we watched the first inning and maybe five or six pitches into watching this high school pitcher pitch. The scout goes, that's a big leaguer and completely tunes out. He had already made up his mind. He saw what he had to see and he was right. And it was a fascinating thing to watch in the moment, a fascinating thing to watch play out. And then to listen to him explain more over the course of that year, you know, why, what did he see? And that type of experience is something that very few people get. And having been able to have that experience combined with the experience of being down in the clubhouse and traveling with the major league team, of working very closely with the R&D group and understanding what they're doing, all of these different experiences across different perspectives and departments has allowed me to have kind of the perspective that I have now. Bendix says his goal is to take this perspective, including what he's learned as an Indians fan and Rays executive, and use it to build the kind of team in Miami that makes positive memories for that city's fans, like he had growing up in Cleveland Heights. I learned that baseball can be a hugely meaningful impact in somebody's life. And it can be an impact for good regardless of whether you win or lose at the end of the day. It's something that brings people together, gives them a common knowledge to talk about, common experiences, positive or negative, to celebrate or commiserate, bonds between you know fathers and sons, all of that romantic stuff, it's, it's true. I experienced it, I saw it firsthand. And to understand that you know I'm having, indirectly, we are having an impact on children in the Miami area, in the South Florida area, and that they are excited to watch Marlins baseball and excited to see what we do this year and hopeful that I can bring them a World Series title, all of that. It's it's a really cool feeling. Looking back to where this all started, with the love and support of his grandmother, Gloria Goldstein, Bendix says he thinks she would be proud. On one hand, she would say that it's incredible and amazing and surreal. And on the other hand, she would she would tell you that she's not surprised that I was always so invested and passionate about baseball. You know, in baseball, they say hope springs eternal. In Miami this year, fans will be looking to Peter Bendix and hoping his mix of passion, compassion, and skill will make all the difference. Stephen Langell, Idea Stream Public Media. That was Idea Stream's Stephen Langell speaking with Cleveland Heights native Peter Bendix, the new president of baseball operations for the Miami Marlins. You can find photos and more on this story online at ideastream.org. Time now for another quick break, but on the other side, we'll discuss a new book that looks back at four centuries of women's diaries. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Anna Huntsman. We'll be right back. You're with The Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Anna Huntsman, in today for Jenny Hamill. Thanks for being with us this hour. Author Sarah Gristwood compiled her new book by doing something unique, looking through other people's diaries. My worst nightmare, but it's a great book. The book is called Secret Voices, A Year of Women's Diaries, and it's a fascinating way to learn about what issues women have been concerned about over the past several centuries. And as much as society has changed in the nearly 400 years of diaries that the book pulls from, it's amazing that a lot of the concerns remain the same. A balance between work and family, demands from overbearing husbands, and worry about how to properly raise a family all play central roles in the entries. As we near the end of Women's History Month, we wanted to discuss this new publication, Secret Voices, and joining me to do that is its author and editor, Sarah Gristwood, who is speaking to us from the UK. Sarah, welcome to The Sound of Ideas. Thank you for having me. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Sarah, I am so excited to pick your brain about this book. I'm curious, what inspired you to compile all of these entries? What was kind of the spark for this idea? Well, I've always been fascinated by women's diaries. I think it 
by diaries in general, but women for me especially, because I think it's that sense of the women from the past speaking to you directly without any kind of censorship, without having to worry about what they were supposed to say. Because so much of the history, the voices, you know, of, of, of women in past centuries was Oh, you shouldn't do that, shouldn't say that, shouldn't feel that. But this is what they really do feel. Right. And I was impressed by how you had many different people from a variety of professions and life experiences. I got the sense, mm. as you mentioned, from you know some of the entries, these women maybe never thought anyone was going to read this diary. And they were really pouring their heart out, whereas other women were intentionally writing diaries. So I guess, could you talk a little bit about that aspect? Yes, absolutely. Some of the women in here, whether it was someone famous like Queen Victoria or like the First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson, must have known that history was going to be interested. Others, like some of the pioneer women crossing America, were maybe writing partly for the record for friends and family back home. But others actually write, wrote their diaries in code. Like a young Beatrix Potter, we all know her as the creator of Peter Rabbit and the rest of it. But in her unhappy youth, she wrote a coded diary where she poured out all the unhappy feelings that she felt she wasn't able to say in public. And I want to talk about some more specific entries in this conversation, but as you're talking about finding all these um, different diaries, I, I want to learn about your process. So where did you find the diaries? Were they libraries and archives? Mm. And then how did you decide which women? Uh, uh, yeah, a mixture. Uh, some like the suffragette diary of being force fed. Yes, it's it's very obscurely in an archive. Others have been published. And I'd like to pay tribute to the amount of work that's been done over just the past years, bringing out dire voices that we hadn't heard before. Often, you know, of, of some of the abolitionists, the anti-slavery crusaders, women who weren't just upper middle class, probably white, writers or, you know, wives of famous people. There's been a real effort to bring out voices right across the spectrum. And how long did this take you, this whole process? Well, <laughs> well, in a way, you could say it's taken me the last 20 years because that's how long I've been keeping an eye out for wow. women's diaries. But that meant that when I actually started that book, this book, I did have a body of work to start on. So because it goes through the days of the year, January 1st, January 2nd, I just started for each day making a long list of all the entries I could find for that day and then started whittling it down so that what was left, what finally made it onto the printed pages, were, was what I really thought was the best of the best. Well, let's talk about that. There are multiple entries per date. So looking at today, it's March 26th. The first one here is from Hannah Colwick. And now she was a Victorian mm. servant. And I believe I read that the man she worked for required her to keep a diary because he was fascinated oh, with yes, working that's women. Right. That's a deeply weird one. She <laughs> was indeed a Victorian maid of all work. So a lot of her diary is very much about, you know, clean the chimneys, clean the boots, clean this, clean everything. But it was this man she called Massa who asked her to keep a diary. And he had, they had a a very bizarre sexual relationship and he wanted her to keep this diary. Uh, he liked to see her coming all black and dirty from her work and, you know, you hesitate to go into it too far really. There's all these entries about her sitting with him on her knees and you think, ooh, 
goodness, yeah. strange stuff, even by the standards of Victorian sexuality. Yeah, but when the, I was reading again, when her diary was published many, many years later, it kind of exposed some of this, the behind the scenes of the Victorian society, right? Yes, it did indeed. The The darker side of Victorian sex life and heaven <laughs> knows there was a darker side. Sure. Well, but there's another least, one from Sally Hester. Yeah. This diary was pres- Yeah, sorry. No, keep going. No, keep going. I said at least it meant this diary was preserved because of course very often the problem from the past is that if servants or you know women not of the the grand families kept diaries, then they probably just disappeared over the years. The hunt really is on for people like Hannah Cullick. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to point out another entry from today was from Sally Hester, who I believe was a pioneer going across um, Mm. uh, the U.S. And it says, took the steamboat this evening for St. Joe, now sailing on the broad Ohio, floating toward the far west. So just wanted to point that one out as well. I did skip ahead a few pages. Um, I saw on April 1st, there were a few April Fool's Day related entries. (laughs) And I saw this from Lady Cynthia Esquith. I think I'm hopefully pronouncing her name right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, She says, remembered the excitement of the April Fool's days of my childhood and felt sadly grown up. And when I read that, I really resonated with that because, you know, I think many Mm. of us can, you know, we remember how the joy of of holidays when we were kids and how sometimes it's Mm. not that same childish joy. But you know, it's something as simple as nostalgia is timeless. And so I was curious, what were some of the other recurring emotions and themes you found while compiling this book? Oh, goodness. Well, I was fascinated, as you said earlier, by just how much did recur. There's quite a lot of frustration in there, I feel. But there's someone like Elizabeth Fry. More than two centuries ago, she was a Quaker. She was a great prison reformer. But she was writing about how she worried that her husband and her children, 11 children, I think, were distracting her from what she saw as her vocation, her career, effectively, and how the husband and children got jealous if she gave too much time to her work. Well, that's one that hasn't exactly gone away today. How to balance career and family. But other things like, you know, ambition, like the determination to keep your own identity, that we are kind of, we pride ourselves a bit on how these are modern inventions, that only modern women have been allowed to feel that way. But guess what? Women hundreds of years back were feeling it and aware of it, even if they could only express it in their diaries. Hmm. Do you feel, as you were looking through all this, were there some periods of time that were harder to find work to use because perhaps women were, I don't know, not trained as much in writing uh, versus now? Yes. The further back you, you go, the harder it gets for exactly those reasons. The earliest entry in this diary, I think it's 1599, but that was um, an an aristocrat, a noble woman. So that's why her diaries made it down to the present day. And there were sort of big bursts of activity. There was a big burst in the 18th century, partly because indeed more women were literate, could read and write, pen and paper were easier to get hold of, but also because there was this this cult of feeling and sensibility. And for the first time, people, women, not just women, were being told that their feelings mattered, that they mattered, that, you know, that, that, that their own personality. Before that, it had been very much, you know, a sort of, well, why do you think you're important enough to put this down? But that pretty much changed. And then in the 19th century, there were these hundreds of Victorian young ladies and pioneers and maidservants and crusaders sitting down and putting their their, their, their feelings, their activities, their opinions down on paper. I know this might be a tough question, but as you were going through all of the diaries, was there a woman that surprised you more than others? Maybe you had a preconceived notion about her, and then as you kind of read more about her, there was a big surprise? 
Well, yes, but I think in a way the one that most struck me was my favourite diarist, if you I mean, yes, there were surprises. With someone like Virginia Woolf, we think of her as this arty Bloomsbury figure, but there she is raving away about how she can talk about nothing but motor cars, how the motor cars made all the difference in her life. And you think, well, Virginia Woolf, petrol head, who knew? But there's a woman called Nella Last, not famous. She was an ordinary housewife in the Second World War, keeping her diary for the, the mass observation, big social observation project. And she began writing, but she through the war and I think through writing the diary, she really found herself. She was a woman in her 50s. But if I can just read a few lines of one entry. Absolutely. Can I? I reflected tonight on the changes the war had brought. I always used to worry and flutter around when I saw my husband was working up for a mood. But now I just say calmly, really, dear, you should try and act as if you were a grown man and not a child of 10. He told me rather wistfully that I was not so sweet since I'd been down working at the centre. And I said, well, who wants a woman of 50 to be sweet anyway? And besides, I suit me a lot better. And I just love that. Yeah. There's this very ordinary, as she'd perceive herself, housewife coming to the kind of realization we all want today yeah yeah that's really that's really fascinating I, I don't know if that day has already happened or if I'll read that later in the year um, but I also wanted to point out that there's a narrative element in some ways too because the yes. diary entries capture the days or weeks or months leading up to major historical events like the assassination of John F Kennedy as told by yes. Lady Bird Johnson you know Anne Frank is is in the book and the entries lead yeah. up to the day you know her family was betrayed. Any other narratives that you'd like to point out? Yes, uh, the, indeed, I did try to do that a little bit. Um, sometimes, of course, you know, on one day you've got different entries from completely diff different centuries and they just stand alone. They're, they're funny or, or moving or whatever. But in other cases, I did want to tell a, t a, a tiny story. So, for example, you've got um, Ada Blackjack, the uh, Inuit woman recruited to a doomed Arctic expedition in the in the, the 1920s, writing about she wound up as the sole survivor of the expedition, but you know how the last other expedition member died and there she was alone. Or you've got Anne Morrow Lindbergh who wrote her diaries over many many years, but I was particularly following the summer after. The, the the kidnap and death of her toddler, a very famous case. You know, it even, it, it, it sparked Agatha Christie's murder on the Orient Express. But she was writing about from the time that the baby, her, 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 her little son's body was found through her emotional process of the last, of of those months, right through to the birth of another baby. And I felt it, 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 it wouldn't, it would be doing a disservice, it wouldn't be fair not to let that story run through. Absolutely. We don't have a ton of time left, but I did want to ask you, kind of looking toward the future, I don't know if mm. people keep diaries as much as they did in the past. I mean, I know many well, people do, but how do you well, think that, yeah, how's that going to work in the future? Mm. No, it's a great question because on the one hand, people are being urged to journal, you know, whether they're on any kind of, sure. of, of life passage, anything like that. But on the other, I do wonder where social media fits in, whether in some ways social media isn't the new form of diary. It's not secret, it's not private, but it's where we put down the little events of every day. Sure. Yeah. So maybe in, I don't know, 100 years, we'll look through a book of, of Instagram pictures or, <laughs> I don't know, tweets or something like that. 
Is there anything else in about, you know, the 30 seconds we have left, anything else that you hope readers will take away from this book? Yeah, I guess just how the experience of women in the past did echo our own. We don't always realise that, but I think there's a lot of strength and support in it. Battles you're fighting, women have been be there before you, they've fought and they've won. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah Grist Gristwood, the author and editor behind Secret Voices, A Year of Women's Diaries, out now. Sarah, thanks so much for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. To get the last word on any of today's topics, you can write it in your diary, or you can send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter, now x at Sound of Ideas, or you can follow me at Anna Huntsman underscore. Tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, we'll talk to former and current women mayors in the region and a political analyst about the successes and challenges of being a woman in politics. We'll also talk to a prominent health economist coming to speak at Case Western Reserve University about why our country's healthcare system can sometimes disincentivize innovation. If you missed any portion of this program, you can find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Anna Huntsman in this week for Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.